Hello and welcome to Let's Play Portal of Evil by Peter Darville Evans. I'll just read the back of the book. Evil forces have been awoken. No one has ever set foot in the dense forest lying to the west of the Cloud High Mountains, until now. Gold fever has hit these inhospitable woodlands and the consequences are terrifying. Some deadly ancient evil has been disturbed and the whole area is suddenly terrorised by mysterious prehistoric creatures. It is up to you, a renowned and hardy adventurer, to destroy this ancient evil before it's too late. Part story, part game, this is a book in which you become the hero. Two dice, a pencil and an eraser are all you need. You decide which routes to take, which dangers to risk and which foes to fight. There's the front cover. Okay, um, there's a map. So there's the Cloud Eye Mountains and there's Klein Castle and things. Although we won't really need it, it's just there for, um, it's just there to be interesting. Okay, um, Portal of Evil. Shunned by humankind since time began, the hills and valleys between the Cloud High Mountains and Lake Mlubs have begun to echo with human voices and the rhythmic sound of pickaxes. With the lure of riches beyond belief, gold fever has hit this inhospitable place. But then one shaft is dug too deep into the hillside, and an ancient source of evil is unleashed and used. The consequences are terrifying, as strange prehistoric creatures roam the woods and miners and their families start to disappear. Only a brave and resourceful adventurer can destroy this ancient evil before it's too late. Two dice, a pencil and an eraser are all you need to embark on this thrilling adventure, which is complete with its elaborate combat system and a score sheet to record your gains and losses. Many dangers lie ahead and your success is by no means certain. You decide which routes to follow, which dangers to risk and which monsters to fight. And there's Peter Darville Evans, the author. Um, yeah, this one wasn't written by Steve Jackson and Ian Livingstone, it just says their name just for posterity. Um, this is my favourite in, in the whole series. Even I prefer it even to the uh, to the first one. 1989. Okay, how to vanquish the portal of evil? You are a warrior, a skilled and hardy adventurer. At the moment, you are down on your luck. You have no money, and your backpack contains provisions for only two meals. Your abilities, however, are more noteworthy and remarkable than ever. You will use dice to determine your exact attributes. On pages 14 to 15, there is an adventure sheet on which you will record your scores and the incidents of your adventure. Use a pencil or make photocopies of the adventure sheet, as you will almost certainly need to make more than one attempt to defeat the threat of the portal of evil. Skill, stamina and luck. Roll one die, add six to the number rolled and enter the total in the skill box on the adventure sheet. We're going to use a text document again. So I'll just write skill, stamina and luck. And we're going to use the old dice program. So it's on um, six sided die. Okay, let's roll once. Okay, uh, you get a four. So add six to that and that's our skill. So we get a ten. Okay, roll two dice, add 12 to this number and enter the total in the stamina box. Roll two dice. Yep, two please. There we go. Really temperamental this program. Um, okay, we get a three. Um, so we add 12 to that and we get a 15. So it's low again, like the last one. Annoying. Um, okay, what's our luck going to be? Okay, um, roll one die, add six to the score, and enter the total in the luck box. Okay, roll one die, and we get a one, whoopee, so we get seven luck. Why am I so unlucky with the dice rolls? It's even worse than the last one. Um, where am I? Okay, so we get a one, so we get seven luck. These are your initial scores and you must keep a permanent record of them. Any of your scores may change during your adventure, but they will exceed their initial amounts only very rarely. You must keep a record of all changes to your scores, so write small or use an eraser. Your skill score reflects your expertise in combat, your ability with weapons and your dexterity. Your stamina is your health and fitness and your ability to survive wounds and physical hardship. Your luck score shows how lucky you are. Okay, um, I think we read through all this in the last book, but I'll do it again. 
Your skill will not change much during your adventure and you should change it only if given specific instructions to do so in the text. A skill is a measure of combat prowess that can be reduced by losing your weapon or by the effects of poison, for instance. Acquiring a magical weapon could increase your skill, but remember that you can use only one weapon at a time. Um, your stamina will change frequently during your adventure as you suffer wounds and then recover. At various times you will be given opportunities to eat meals and to acquire provisions. Eating a meal normally restores up to four points of stamina, although there will be times when you get very hungry, when you will need to eat a meal simply to avoid losing stamina. You may eat only one meal at a time, even though you may have more in your backpack. Unless specifically stated, your stamina may never exceed its initial score. Luck. There will be times when, ex when the success or failure of your exploits will depend entirely on your luck. You will be instructed to test your luck. The procedure for this is as follows. Roll two dice. If the total roll is equal to or less than your luck score, you are lucky. If the total is higher than your, s uh, than your luck score, you are unlucky. Whatever the outcome, you must deduct one point from your luck score every time you test your luck. As you will see, the more you use your luck, the less likely you are to be lucky. There will be occasions when you will be able to recover some points of luck. However, unless specifically stated to the contrary, your score cannot exceed its initial value. Okay, uh, we know the the rules for um, uh, we know the rules for um, for combat. You roll two dice. Pretty much, this is just. Um, concisely um, explained by rolling two dice. The first one is for is for the enemy. Add the score for the dice to his skill and that's his attack strength. Then do the same for you, that's yours. Whoever has, has the highest wins and, and, will knock, uh, and will knock two stamina points from the opponent. Um, you can use luck and if you're lucky it's only um, it, it'll be four points knocked from him and if he's and if you if if you're lucky receiving a blow it's only one point blow um, that's effect uh, there that affects you if you're unlucky um, it's three um, if you're unlucky when you use luck against him that means um, you only do one point of damage. Um, again, like in, in the last book, it's best never to use luck in battle because it's a waste of luck. Um, you should only use it when you need to. Because um, uh, fighting, if you if you go the correct route, which I will be doing, you should hardly need um, luck at all, and sh you should hardly battle the most fearsome of enemies. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, the escape rules are the same as the last book, uh, the last one I did. So if you choose to escape, you have to um, reduce your stamina by two points. It counts as them getting a hit in. Again, I've already explained using luck in combat. Um, okay, um, getting started. The forests that cover the hills between Klein Castle and the Cloud High Mountains are extensive and are populated by dangerous denizens. You are very unlikely to succeed in your mission at the first attempt. It is recommended that you make notes and draw a map as you explore. There is a way to succeed that involves little risk, even if you start with low initial scores. That's me. There are many more routes that lead to failure and unpleasant fates. Start by reading the background section, then go on to the paragraph headed with the number 1. After that, go to whichever numbered paragraph you are instructed to turn to. Do not read paragraphs you have not been led to. This amounts to cheating and will lessen your enjoyment. Okay, does it say what, what I have? Um, does it say what equipment I start with? Oh, here we go. Um, we have no money, but we have provisions for two meals, so let's put that in. So provisions two. I'm sure we have a sword or something. Um, so what equipment we have. Um, what equipment do we have? Oh, here we go. 
You're wearing leather armor and your trusty sword. Okay, I'll read that in a bit when I read this. Okay, background. Far to the east of the great port of Keltha, a line of snow-capped peaks divides the fertile lands from the deserts and wastes that make up the interior of the continent of Kool. To the humans who have settled along the streams that run from the northern half of the range, the peaks are known as the Cloud High Mountains. Halfway down the range, a spur extending to the west marks the southward limit of human habitation, or rather it did until recently. From the southern half of the range, streams rush through narrow valleys between hills that are covered with Im impenetrable woodlands and drain into an inland sea. The forest is home to wild beasts and to goblins, whose name for the huge lake is Mlubs. No humans had set foot in the forest within recorded history. Southern tribesmen and, in later centuries, armoured Newburgers had shunned the inhospitable hills. A few years ago, however, a small band of trailblazers set out from the frontier town of Kleincastle and disappeared in into the forest. Months later, two survivors returned with gold nuggets gold, that soft, malleable metal, useless, f useless for making weapons or tools or even lodestones, and yet, in a way, a magnet. Its matchless lustre attracts not other metals, but human greed. Within days, as if drawn by an invisible force, humanity began to invade the forest from north and south. Some came alone, with just a pickaxe and a shovel. Others came as families or, or in entire tribes. Some groups were as big as small armies. There were miners and then and there were those who provisioned the miners and others who swindled them. There, there were robbers of all sorts from desperate outlaws to clerks and lawyers. Finally there were the Margraves men come to tax everyone else. Bridges were slung across raging cataracts. Giant trees were felled, battalions of man-eating goblins were defeated and dispersed. Bands of outlaws roamed the hills, more deadly even than the forest creatures. In an effort to restore law and order, and to generate income, the Margrave of Kleincastle declared the whole forest to be part of his demesne. I don't know what that word is. Um, now his foot soldiers march across the hills, chasing bandits, selling mining licenses, and dealing summarily with unlicensed miners. To the miners, the Margrave soldiers are just one more irritation. Like the goblins and the southern bandits, they interfere with the serious business of digging for gold. The most successful miners are already wealthy enough to defy the Margrave. They employ teams of less fortunate migrants to work the richest seams located deep under the higher mountains, and they organise caravans to transport ore from the highland diggings through the forest to Kleincastle, now a bustling boomtown where equally wealthy merchants wait to weigh, assay, and buy their loads. One of the most successful mine owners is Gloton. Recently he sent out invitations to selected warriors, including you, to come to Kleincastle and work for him as caravan guards. At the time you had better things to do than trudge back and forth through a hilly forest at the beck and call of a wealthy mine owner, and you declined the offer. Now, however, something is very wrong in the forest. Gloton has sent out messengers with another story. Miners and sometimes entire families have gone missing from their villages. Strange beasts, the like of which have never been seen before, are terrorising the woodlands, and Gloton pleads for one of Cool's renowned warriors to come to Klein Castle and investigate these mysterious occurrences. He declares that he will pay the warrior's own weight in gold in return for restoring normality to the forest. You could refuse neither the appeal for help nor the lure of such a reward. With the last two coins you possessed, you have bought a map of the area, it is, it is reproduced on the inside front cover of this book, and you have it safely stowed in your backpack, along with what remains of your provisions. After your long journey from Keltha, you, you now have enough for only two more meals. You are wearing leather armour, your trusty sword hangs in its sheath at your belt. Okay, so we have leather armour and a sword. Um, sword, leather armor. Uh, you reach the forest without incident. However, thanks to a rainstorm and the flooding of a ford, you manage to miss the road that links Newburgh and Festam to Kleincastle and find yourself in the, in the depths of the woodlands. Last night, you slept rough in the undergrowth. 
This morning you came across a well-worn track leading southwest, which you hope will lead you out of the forest and towards Klein Castle, where you expect to find Gloton and offer your services to him for the promised fee. With luck you will reach the, uh, the little town before dusk. Now turn to paragraph one. I'll do a bit of this now before I end the video. Okay, a line of blood spots crosses the path. The blood is still warm and unclotted. Your hand goes to your sword hilt as you scan the surrounding forest. You can hear nothing, but it is clear that a wounded animal has crossed the path. A very large animal, to judge by the extent of broken branches and trampled undergrowth that show where the creature crashed into the forest. You follow the trail between the trees and into a clearing, where you stop in amazement. The wounded animal is there, but it is not a bear or a wolf, or any other woodland beast you have ever seen. It is, it is like an enormous lizard, as big as an ox, with a sail-like frill running the length of its back and supported by spines. Its scaly hide shows several severe gashes. Stroking the monster's snout is an elf woman. As you enter the glade, the monster snarls and the elf woman raises her sword, but then instead of attacking, they speak. Both of them say, help us, please help us. Even as they speak, two soldiers come running into the clearing, swords drawn and advance towards the wounded beast. Will you help to defend the monster, or will you stand aside and await the outcome of the confrontation? We are going to, def uh, to defend the monster. 229. Okay, one of the soldiers runs to attack the monster and the elf woman while you intercept the other. He seems to be in no mood to talk and attempts to barge past you. You fight. If you survive long enough to reduce the stamina to three points or less, he turns and runs away into the forest. Okay, so we have a soldier. Skill. Five. Stamina. Eight enemy attack. My attack. All right, let's do this. I should win this easily. Come on, there we are. Don't want three dice. Okay, um, okay, that's his. That's twelve overall, and I have nineteen. So that's twelve to nineteen. So he's put down to six. And again. Okay, he has um, 11, and I have 17. So 11 to 17. Which means he's put down to four. So just one more hit, and then he'll run away, according to the book. He gets 5, that's a 10, and I get 5, that's a 15. So 10 to 15. He's put down to 2, so he runs away now. That's that. He turns and runs away in, into the forest. Turn to 320. The monster and the elf woman have fought off the other soldier, whom you see limping away between the trees. The monster is very badly wounded and seems to be near death. It is not surprising that you have never seen anything like it before. It is a Spinosaurus, an animal that became extinct millions of years ago. You ask the elf woman where it came from, but it is the Spinosaurus itself that replies, I can speak for myself, warrior, it says. I was once an elf, although I myself find it hard to believe. My entire hunting party was captured by a horde of cursed slave warriors. They took us underground and put us one by one through the dread portal. All my comrades were overcome, their willpower broken, and they became mindless slaves of the portal, or of whoever controls it. I resisted. I would not let my mind be wiped clean. I lost consciousness, and when I awoke, I was as you see me. There are others like me. Many have gone mad. This foul body I inhabit is, I believe, of a sort that is common on the other side of the portal, but only the portal slaves may go there. No one knows the extent of this evil except perhaps Gartax, but you must be gone. The forest is a deadly place now. Will you hurriedly rejoin the path and continue towards Klein Castle, 10 to 143, or will you try to find out more about Gartax? We're going to try and find out more about Gartax. 
then into 74. You have many questions that you would like to ask. What are the slave warriors? Where is this evil portal? But it is clear that the elf, imprisoned in the body of the badly wounded Spinosaurus, is almost exhausted. Gasping for breath, it manages to continue. The Margrave in, in Klein Castle, the mine owners, the king of the goblins, even the wood elves, none of them know how bad things are here. Gartax was a miner. He had the sense to get people out of his village before the slave warriors arrived. Now he, he and his followers live in the forest, trying to organise some kind of resistance. He's camped not far from here, half a league to the southeast. He can explain what's going on. Now I must rest. Thanks for your help, warrior. You return to the path. Will you now continue along it, southwestwards, towards Klein Castle? Or will you strike out eastward, straight into the wild and wooded foothills of the Cloud High Mountains? Or will you enter the forest in a south-easterly direction, hoping to find Gartax. We're going to look for Gartax. 263. You hack away up overgrown slopes, slide down treacherous banks and splash across tree-shadowed streams. You join a narrow path which soon leads you to a clearing, in the centre of which a solitary tree spreads its shade. You step into the clearing, uncomfortably aware that the surrounding forest is unnaturally quiet. As you reach the central tree, you hear the rustle of branches from the far side of the glade, and you see a man run into the open, closely pursued by a creature from a nightmare. It is a forohacos. <laughs> A vicious, flightless bird, much taller than a human, with a huge curved beak and glittering eyes surmounted by a crest of feathers. The man looks frail and tired. He's limping and is armed with only a small knife. With an, uh, with an ululating cry, the cruel bird chases him uh, relentlessly as he tries to back away. If you want to come to the man's rescue, turn to 176. If you'd rather avoid getting involved and return to the cover of the forest, turn to 101. We're going to help him. 176. Drawing your sword, you run across the glade and step between the giant bird and the exhausted man. You stare into the beast's cold eyes and raise your sword to strike, and then you feel a knife point against your spine. Behind you, the man chuckles. Our little ruse worked. Agrid, this warrior shows true nobility in intervening to protect the weak and, and helpless. I think I acted the victim's part very convincingly. Now, warrior, put up your sword. Surrender. Will you sheathe your sword and surrender, or will you swing a swing round and attack the man? We're going to surrender. 292. You have made a wise choice, my friend, says the man, as about a dozen roughly dressed men and women armed with axes and staves converge on you from all sides of the clearing. Now then, why are you here in the forest? You describe your incredible meeting with the talking Spinosaurus and explain that you are looking for Gartax. The man is not impressed. Gartax? He's no more than a brigand, from what I've heard. <coughs> and the rabble that follow him are worse. You haven't answered my question. You're a trained fighter. What are you doing in this part of the world? If you apply that you are on your way to Klein Castle in response to Gloton's appeal for help in investigating the mysterious occurrences in the forest, turn to 90. If you say that you are a free booting adventurer who just happened to be in the area, turn to 216. We're on our way to Klein Castle, so it's best to be honest, so let's go to 90. So, the bigwigs in Klein Castle have decided to do something at last, or at least Gloton has. He's the sharpest of the mine owners. He started out himself as a miner, just like us. I believe your story. I'm Gartax. These are some of my people. The rest are in, are in camp to the south. We have to go back there now. Come with us. A trained sword will be useful. You accompany Gartax at the head of his short column of rough and ready troops. Bit by bit he tells you his story. Gartax and his people lived in villages in the foothills of the Cloud Eye Mountains, alarmed by a sudden influx of ferocious and abnormal beasts and by the disappearance of villagers. Gartax and his followers took to the forest. Now Gartax tells you, entire settlements are being found deserted. Silent pale-skinned soldiers, the slave warriors, infest the 
area, and some of them are recognisable as mining folk who disappeared weeks ago. Others are tribesmen from the south, and some are goblins. Gartax had intended to create a woodland army to resist these invaders, but their numbers increased daily, and Gartax's only aim now is to lead his followers safely out of the forest. Finally, Gartax falls silent. Will you ask for information about Gloton, or ask if there's anyone else who can help? We want to find out about this Gloton, so 362. Gloton, it cheers me up just to think of the fellow. He's a wealthy man now, of course. They say he could match the Margrave himself, coin for coin and gem for gem. But he's laboured for his riches, not like some of those thieving merchants down from Newburgh. Through the trees, do you see the mountains in the east? Gloton's done his share of grubbing under them, and now he owns some of the best gold-bearing soil in the whole of Cool. I know a few secrets about old Gloton, like where he keeps his personal hoard of gems, and I know something else he doesn't he doesn't like spread about the fact that he's a dwarf it's true every other mine owner and gold merchant in Klein Castle is as human as I am and Gloton knew they wouldn't accept a dwarf into their circle so he shaved off his beard and bought himself some built up boots and the only people who know are we miners who've dug alongside him a word of advice if you, if you ever want anything from Gloton challenge him to a pickaxe handle fight he can't resist it let him win mind and then tell him he's got the strength of a dwarf then he'll do anything for you you thank Gartax for the advice do you ask him about the secret of Gloton's treasure, or ask Gartax if there is anyone else who can help him and his followers. Um, we're going to ask Gartax if there's anyone else who can help. 185. Um, if you ask about the the treasure, um, he just tells you how to get Gloton's treasure, but the only way to get it is, is to steal it, and if you do that, uh, Gloton won't help you, so there's no point in knowing. So we'll go to 185, if I remember correctly about that, which I do. Played this game many times. Um, yeah. Gartax shakes his head, and his shoulders slump. Our only hope is to get out of the forest before the slave warriors corner us. I don't expect any help. The Margrave soldiers are too busy extorting taxes out of honest folk. The big mine owners are safe in Klein Castle, and haven't a clue what's going on here. If you want to do something useful, find the Wizard of Lake Mlubs. That's the goblin's name for the in inland sea. That's at the far southern end of the forest. It's said this wizard has been there for centuries, longer even than the goblins themselves. If anyone knows what's... If anyone knows what's behind these evil events, it's the wizard. I've met him just the once. If you tell him what I've told you and ask for help in my name, I'm sure he'll do everything he can. The lake's not hard to find. Just go south until you come to a stream that's too wide and, and deep to jump or wade across, and then follow it down to the place where it flows in, into the lake. And now there's no more time for talk. We've arrived. Okay, that ends part one. Um, in part two, I'll be turning to 310 and continuing the adventure. So thanks for watching, and bye-bye.